Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Tevedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati and what we were discussing in the course Molecular Biology, we are discussing about the uh, cell biology, we discuss about the cellular processes, we discuss about the different types of organelles and then we have also discussed about the biomolecules, their function and then uh, followed by it we have also discussed about the genetic material. So, we discuss about the genetic material in the prokaryotes, eukaryotes and how the geno genetic material is being packed into these two different types of organisms. And uh, subsequent to that we were also discussing about the central dogma of molecular biology. So, within the central dogma of molecular biology so far what we have discussed, we have discussed about the replication transcription and in this current module we are discussing about the translations. So, as we said that uh, the central dogma of molecular biology is a uh, very very important uh, uh, phenomena in which the three different types of activities such as the uh, production of or the, gen or the synthesis of the new DNA from the pre existing DNA is being done by a process known as replications whereas, the RNA is being produced from the uh, DNA with a process known as transcription and in today's uh, and in this current module we are discussing about the translation where the information what is given on the RNA is being used to synthesize the protein molecules. Uh, if you recall in our previous lecture we have discussed about the prokaryotic replications. So, we have discussed about the uh, different types of machinery what is required for prokaryotic replications. So, we discuss about the ribosomes, tRNA, messenger RNA and so on. And then uh, we have also discussed about how the different types of events are happening such as initiation, elongation and terminations in the case of the prokaryotic system. In today's lecture we are going to discuss about the eukaryotic system. So, uh, before we get into the detail of what is the uh, major difference of the uh, translation in the prokaryotic versus eukaryotic. We would like to uh, you know give you a very small uh, uh, description about the uh, machinery what is required for the translations and then we are actually going to uh, tell you uh, in detail about the uh, different processes what is happening in the case of the uh, eukaryotic translations. So, eukaryotic translation is a is a process or the translation is the process of messenger RNA coded protein synthesis which is a universal process that occurs both in the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes. Members of the uh, prokaryotes or the eukaryotes use the information what is given in the messenger RNA which comes from the DNA by transcription to synthesize the protein with the ribosome as a machinery. Uh, protein perform a variety of critical functions such as enzymes, structural proteins or hormones and therefore, they are crucial for the biological component and that is why we said that the central dogma of molecular biology is very very crucial because it explains how the different events are connected to each other and why they are so much crucial because once you have a requirement of a particular hormone, you are actually going to activate the transcription of that particular gene and then you are actually going to activate the translational machinery. So, that the ribosomes will go and sit on that particular RNA and it will going to give you the proteins. Uh, protein biosynthesis uh, has a key role in the disease uh, as changes and occurs uh, errors in this process through underlining DNA mutations or protein misfolding are often the underlining cause of the disease. And protein machinery is very very crucial because it can give you a misfolded protein, it can give you a protein which may have mutations, it may give you the protein which may not be useful for or it may not be optimal uh, for you know doing the its uh, natural function. And because of these things uh, it may actually lead to the uh, development of the disease. So, uh, the process by which the sequence of nucleotide in a messenger RNA molecule direct the incorporation of the amino acid into the protein is called as the translation. So, this is all uh, we have already discussed, but I thought when we were discussing about the eukaryotic translation, we, we should also briefly discuss about these uh, aspects as well. So, that it will refresh your memories, so that it will be easy for you to uh, follow the, uh, the follow the content actually. 
Now, as far as the machinery is concerned, the machinery required for translating the language of the messenger RNA into language of protein is composed of the four primary components. So, it requires the messenger RNA, right? So, that is the component number one, and that is the most crucial component. Then you require the tRNAs. So, you require the tRNA so that it can actually be able to read the um, uh, the anticodons uh, with the help of the codon versus anticodon interrecognitions uh, and the other side it also can supply the specific amino acids then it also requires the ribosomes and it also requires the different types of proteins and as well as the enzymes so that it can actually be able to perform the different types of activities such as amino acid tRNA uh, acylations and all that and peptidyl transferase. So, enzymes are two there are two crucial enzymes you have you require the amino acid tRNA synthetase and you also require the peptidyl transferase. As far as the protein is concerned you also require different types of translational uh, factors. Uh, we have discussed many of these translational factors when we were talking about the prokaryotic uh, tra translations. So, let us start with the first component and the first component is the messenger RNA. So, messenger RNA is a single standard RNA molecule that is complementary to the one of the strand of a gene. During the protein synthesis, a ribosomes move along the messenger RNA, read its uh, waste sequences and uses the genetic code to translate the each codon into a corresponding amino acid. So, this is the eukaryotic um, uh, messenger RNA where you are going to have the 5 prime UTR regions, you are going to have the coding sequence and then you are also going to have the 3 prime UTR region and then you are going to have the poly A tail. And the majority of the 5 prime UTR region or the 3 prime UTR region is actually the regulatory regions where the many of these uh, regulatory proteins are going to bind and that is how they are actually going to uh, regulate the translation. Uh, in the within the coding sequence you are going to have the starting codon and you are also going to have the stop codon. So, in the uh, in the case of eukaryotic system you are going to have the start codon as AUG and which is actually going to code for methionine whereas, the there are three st uh, stop codons UA, UG, UAG and UGA and these are the three stop codon which are also been the stop codon into the prokaryotic system. Then uh, we have the tRNA. So, I am going to I am going through very fast with these content because the already we have discussed. So, this is the uh, uh, you know the nucleotide sequence of the tRNA where you have this uh, D arm right or then you are going to have the anticodon arm, then you are going to have T psi C arm and this is actually going to be C C end. So, this is going to be start from 5 prime end you are going to have D arm, anticodon loop, T psi C loops and the C C end. And the C C end you know that it is actually going to bind the amino acid on one side whereas, the anticodon loop is going to have the anticodon which is actually going to recognize the codon onto the uh, on the uh, messenger RNA and that is how it is actually going to serve the dual purposes. It is going to serve, it is going to first identify the messenger RNA on one side and it is going to bring the uh, corresponding amino acid uh, from the uh, 3 prime ends. So, it the primary sequence, uh, primary structure of the RNA is a linear sequence of the nucleotides, secondary structure is called as the clover leaf models and the tertiary structure is called as the 3D structure of tRNA or the L shape or the helix packing. So, these are the some of the different names what we are using. The tRNA uh, is also called as transfer tRNA, transfer RNA is a type of RNA molecule that helps to decode a messenger RNA sequence into a protein and it is made up of a single standard polynucleotide chain. It function at a specific site in the ribosome during translation which is a process that synthesizes the protein from and messenger RNA molecules. Proteins are built up from the smaller units called as the amino acids which are specified by the three nucleotide messenger RNA sequence called as codon. All these we have already discussed when we were discussing in detail uh, when we were discussing about the prokaryotic system. So, each codon represent a particular amino acid and each codon is recognized by a specific tRNA. They are adapter between the codon and the amino acids. Each tRNA has its corresponding amino acid attached to its 3 prime end and the tRNA is uh, named as uh, sRNA or the soluble or the supernatant RNA and the adapter RNA. Uh, 
tRNA, the 10 to 15 percent of the total cellular RNA which actually includes the methender RNA or uh, ribosomal RNA and the tRNA. So, out of these three RNA species, uh, total of the 10 to 15 percent is the tRNA species. Uh, 74 to 95 uh, nucleotides are present in the each tRNA molecules, then it has the 3.8 sedimentation coefficient and the molecular weight of the tRNA is between the 25,000 to 30,000 Dalton. The structure of tRNA can be decom decomposed into the primary structures, secondary structures and the tertiary structures. Secondary structure is also coined, be, uh, called as the clover leaf model whereas the tertiary structure is called as L shaped structure. In addition to the usual uh, nucleotide bases, uh, it also tRNA contains a number of unusual bases uh, such as inosine, pseudouracil and dihydrouridine. Uh, and the, these are the amino acid uh, modified nucleotides which are being uh, by methylation. So, for example, the inosine is going to be produced from the adenine, pseudouridine, uh, uracil is from produced from the uracil and uh, pseudouridine is produced from the uridine. So, other unusual amino acid found is uh, hypoxanthine, thymine and uh, methylguanine. So, this is the structure of the tRNA, this is the, this is the clover leaf uh, model of the tRNA where you have the 3 prime end which is also called as the CCA end, then you are going to have T psi C loop, D loop, anticodon loop and all that. So, 5 prime terminal is a phosphate group right and then you are going to have the acceptor st uh, stem, it is a 7 to 9 base pair stem by the base pairing of 5 prime nucleotide with the 3 prime nucleotide. Then you have a CCA tail, it is a cytosol, cytosine amino acid sequence at the 3 prime end of the tRNA molecule, the amino acid loaded onto tRNA by the amino acid tRNA synthesis to form the amino acid tRNA is covalently attached to the 3 prime hydroxyl group onto the TR CCA tail. Uh, D loop, it is a 4 to 6 base pair uh, stem ending in the loop that often contains the dihydrouridine. Then you have anticodon loop, uh, it is a 5 base pair stem which loop contains the anticodon and anticodon is going to recognize the genetic code or the codon what is present onto the messenger RNA. And then you have a T arm, it is a 4 to 5 base pair stem containing sequence of T psi C where psi, uh, psi is the pseudouridine, a modified uridine actually. Uh, let us talk about then the ribosome. So, ribosome is actually the real machinery of the protein synthesis which is different from the prokaryotic system versus eukaryotic system. In the prokaryotic system you have the 70S ribosome whereas in the eukaryotic system you have the 80S ribosomes. So, eukaryotic ribosomes are larger, they are 80S ribosomes and are more complex than the prokaryotic ribosome which are 70S. Ribosome exists normally as a separate subunit that are composed of the proteins and the ribosomal RNA. The subunits come together to form a ribosome when they bind to a messenger RNA near its 5 prime end. On binding to the messenger RNA, the ribosome read the nucleotide sequence from the 5 prime to 3 prime directions synthesizing the corresponding protein from the amino acid in a N terminal to C terminal directions. Ribosomes are located in the cytoplasm either freely floated or the associated with the endoplasmic reticulum, right. They serve to synthesize the proteins. The ribosomes are ribonucleoprotein particles to which the multiple ribosome proteins are uh, bound. The sequence and the structure of ribosomal components are conserved in all kingdom under underlining the common origin of the translational uh, operators. The ribosome provide the platform for proper assembly of the messenger RNA, tRNA and the protein factors. It consists of a small and the large subunits. So, this is the structure of the uh, large subunit and this is the structure of the small subunit and uh, it has uh, three different types of binding sites. It has E site, it has a P site and it has an A site. And the mammalian ribosome which is a ATS ribosome is consist of the two subunit. This is a large subunit and this is a small subunit and the large subunit is composed of the different types of RNA species such as 20S uh, ribosomal RNA, 5.8S ribosomal RNA and 5S ribosomal RNA and then it also contains the 49 different types of proteins. So, all these 49 different types of proteins when they come together along with the 28S ribosomal RNA, 5.8S ribosomal RNA and 5S ribosomal RNA that is actually going to give you a large subunit which is 
going to have a segmentation coefficient as 60 s. Then you also have the small subunit which is a 40 s uh, subunit and uh, that contains the 18 s ribosomal RNA and the, the 33 different types of proteins and when they come together they are actually going to make the ribonucleoproteins and they are actually going to make the small subunit. which is going to be 40 s and together they were actually going to when they will combine together they are actually going to give you the 80 s uh, complete ribosomal particle which is going to participate into the protein synthesis. Now, as far as the uh, binding site is concerned the they are actually going to have the three binding site for tRNAs they are going to have A site, P site and E site. A site is the site where the new amino acid or the new tRNA is actually going to enter. The P site is the site where the, pepti uh, the peptide bond is going to be formed and the E site is the exit site from where the uncharged uh, tRNA is actually going to get removed. So, all three sites are formed by the ribosomal molecules into the ribosomes during the elongation the incoming RNA molecule binds to the uh, A site. The P site is where the tRNA linked to the growing uh, polypeptide chain is bound and the E site is the bonding site for the unloaded uh, tRNA prior to its release from the ribosomes. Now, as far as the uh, translation in the eukaryotic is concerned they are actually going to have the three important events initiation, elongation and uh, terminations. So, initiation uh, it sets the stage for the polypeptide synthesis. So, it is actually going to assemble all the protein components, it is going to assemble the ribosomes, it is going to have all those events so that the uh, it is going to you know uh, bring the raw material actually. And then it is going to enter into the second phase which is the elongation. So, that causes the sequential addition of the amino acids to the polypeptide chain as determined by the uh, codons what are present onto the messenger RNA and then you are going to have the termination. So, this brings the polypeptide synthesis to a halt because once it reaches to a uh, stop codon then it is actually going to terminate. So, let us first start with the uh, initiation. So, initiation um, you, if you recall we have discussed about the initiation in the prokaryotic system. Now, when we are going to discuss about the initiation into the eukaryotic system we just want to first understand what is the difference between the two uh, different types of events before we get into the detail of the initiation into the eukaryotic system. There are significant differences between the initiation of the uh, pro initiation stage of the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes. Uh, in eukaryotes there is only one start codon for the eukaryotes such as AUG and it codes for the methionine it does not code for the N formyl methionine. So, eukaryotic cell need more initiation factor than the prokaryotic system. For example, the eukaryotic cell requires the 12 different types of initiation factor whereas, the prokaryotic system requires the lesser number of initiation factors. In pro eukaryotes the presence of association of messenger RNA with the small subunit is more complex than the prokaryotes. Uh, 40S subunit identify the 5 prime methylated cap of the messenger RNA and there is a scanning process involved whereas, the initiation codon is recognized. This recognition is added by the ATP dependent helicases that hydrolyze the ATP. This recognition of initiation codon is also been aided by the COSAC sequences and COSAC sequences are very much same as what we have seen in the, the role of the Schein-Dargano sequences into the prokaryotes. So, let us uh, discuss about the initiation. So, uh, the initiation of the translation in the eukaryotes involve the many initiation factors or the EFIs and it is divided into the four stage. In the stage 1 the ribosome is going to be dissociate, in the stage 2 the complex of 43 pre initiation complex is going to be formed and then this 43S initiation complex is going to be converted into the 40S initiation complex and then ultimately it is actually going to have the formation of 80S initiation complex. This means the ribosome is going to be fully assembled onto the messenger RNA and then it will enter into the elongation phase and that is how it is actually going to start the initial elongations. So, 
During this particular phase, it requires the many type of accessory proteins and initiation factors for performing the different types of functions and as I said in the formation of these kind of pre initiation complexes. So, it will require the different types of initiation factors. So, some of the initiation factors are called as core initiation factors whereas, the other factors are called as the accessory initiation factors. So, these are the initiation uh, core initiation factors. So, you have the EF1 and EF2 EF1 A and that enhance the pin initiation complex formation helps in ribosomal scanning assure the steadiness of the AUT selection prevents the premature hydrolysis of the EF2. Then we have the elongation initiation factor 2 and that assists the binding of the methionine tRNA met to the 40S ribosome by forming a ternary complex of the initiation uh, eukaryotic initiation factor 2 GTP and uh, met tRNA. Then you have the eukaryotic initiation factor 2 and in eukaryotic initiation factor 3. So, the first initiation factor binding to the 40S subunit and promote the further steps having the uh, you know the gonadine uh, nucleotide exchange factor activity. So, and then we have the uh, eukaryotic uh, initiation factor 4A that contains the two domains. So, it has the dead box ATPase domain and the ATP dependent RNA helicase activity. Then we have the uh, initiation factor 4B that is the cofactor of the initiation factor 4A and it enhances the helicase activity of the initiation factor 4A. Then we have the initiation factor 4E and that binds to the 5 prime cap of the messenger RNA that is the M7 GPPPG cap right. Then we have the initiation factor 4F that recruits the 40S to the 5 prime end of the messenger RNA. Then we have the initiation factor 4G and that is scaffolds for the initiation factor 4E, initiation factor 4A, initiation factor 3, initiation PAB. Uh, slip 1 and messenger RNA and also participate in enhancing the helicase activity of the initiation factor 4A. Then we have the initiation factor 4H that enhances the helicase activity of the initiation factor 4A. And then we also have the initiation factor 5A and 5 and the 5B that having the JTPS activity that hydrolyzes and promote the dissociation of the various initiation factors from the 40S and also leads to the association of the 60S subunit to form the 80S ribosomes. And then we have the auxiliary initiation factors. So, they are, these are called as uh, DHX29, DEAD1, initiation factor 6, P97 and PAB. So, DHX29 is having the helicase activity which contains the D dead box functioning in the initiation step and also require for the ribosomal scanning onto the messenger RNA. Then we have the DED1 and it is a homologous of DHX29 found in the Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Then we have the initiation factor 6 that binds to the 60S subunit and prevents it binding with the 40S subunit. Then we have P97 that is homologous to the C terminals of the initiation factor 4A and considered as a translational repressor under the normal cellular conditions. Then we have PAB, it binds to the poly A tail of the messenger RNA also with the initiation factor 4A and initiation factor of RF3A. It promotes the circularization of the messenger RNA and it stimulates to the 40S uh, subunit recruitments. So, the first step is the uh, RBs, uh, ribosomal dissociation. So, so, ATS ribosome dissociate to form the 40S and the 60S subunits. The two initiation factor namely the initiation factor 3 and the initiation factor 1A binds to the newly formed 40S subunit thereby block its reassociation with the 60S subunit. This means this uh, ribosome is going to be first uh, the ribosome where the you know initially the ribosome would be involved into the protein synthesis and as soon as the, it will reach to the termination site then it will get distance you know dissociate and it is going to dissociate into the 40S. Uh, and the 60S ribosomes. Once the 40S is being produced, then it is actually going to be bind by the initiation factor 3 and initiation factor 1A and it is going to bind in such a way that it is going to block the association of these two because they will get recruited and they will be get associated but with the new messenger RNA. 
and uh, then only it is actually going to start the initiation of the new messenger RNA, right? So, for initiating the new cycle, it has to be dissociated from the older cycle. So, it is actually present on the some other messenger RNA and it reaches to the termination site. So, at the, when it reaches to the termination site, the, the protein synthesis is going to stop, but the ribosome has to be dissociated, ribosome has to be broken apart so that you are going to have the 40S and the 60S subunits available and these 40S, 60S subunit will assemble onto the new messenger RNA on which it is actually going to start the initiation and that is why this is actually the first step right and the second step is that the formation of 43 pre initiation complex. So, a ternary complex containing the initiation tRNA that is the MET tRNA and the initiation uh, uh, factor 2 bounds to the GTP attached to the 40S subunit to form the 43 uh, uh, pre initiation complex. The presence of the initiation factor 3 and initiation 1A stabilizes this complex. So, remember that these two factors are also important for uh, you know blocking the attachment site so that it should not form the uh, ATS ribosomes. Then we have the formation of the 48 initiation complex. So, the binding of messenger RNA to the 48-3S uh, initiation complex results in the formation of 48 initiation complex to the intermediate 43-S initiation complex. So, initiation factor 4F complex is formed by the association of the initiation factor 4G, initiation factor 4A and the initiation factor 4E. The initiation factor 4F referred to as a cap binding protein binds to the cap of the messenger RNA and then the initiation factor 4A and the 4B binds to the messenger RNA and reduces its complex structure. This messenger RNA in then transferred to the 43S uh, complex. For the appropriate association of the 43 pre initiation complex with the messenger RNA energy has to be supplied by the ATP. The ribosomal initiation complex scan the messenger RNA for the identification of the appropriate initiation complex that is the 5 prime AUG and then it is actually going to initiate the formation of the ATS ribosomes. So, uh, the next step is the formation of the ATS initiation complex. So, 48 initiation complex binds to the 46 uh, 60S ribosomal subunit to form the ATS initiation complex. The binding involves the hydrolysis of GTP this is bound to the initiation factor 2 and this step is facilitated by the in involvement of the initiation factor 5. As the ATS complex is formed, the initiation factor bound to the 40S initiation complex are released and the recycled. So, these are all the events what is being shown here that uh, you are going to have the dissociation of the uh, ribosomes. So, in the first step, the you are going to have the dissociation of the ribosomes. So, 40S, 40S and 60S which are present on to the previous uh, some other messenger RNA where they have actually completed the protein synthesis this is actually going to assemble uh, going to dissociate it and the 60S is going to be get separated and the 40S is going to get separated. So, as soon as the 40S is going to form it is actually going to bind the initiation factor 1 and initiation factor 1A and the initiation factor 3. And then it is actually going to bind all these uh, you know met tRNA and met tRNA initiation factor 2 GTP and all that and that is how it is actually going to form the 43 initiation complex. So, that is going to be the second step and once the 43 initiation complex is formed then it is actually going to bind the initiation factor 4E, 4G, 4A and 4B and after that it is actually going to be good enough to recruit the messenger RNA and once the messenger RNA is being recruited then the 43 messenger RNA complex is going to form onto the messenger RNA and then it is going to start scanning with the help of the ATP hydrolysis to know where the st uh, starting codon is right and then uh, it is actually going to form the uh, 49S uh, pre initiation complex. And once it find the pre initiation complex 49 initiation complex and it found that there is a AUG right then it actually going to recruit the 60S ribosomes and 60S also going to assemble and that is how it is actually going to form the ATS initiation complex onto the initiation uh, uh, codons. 
now it enters into the elongation phase. So, ribosomes elongates the polypeptide chain by sequential addition of the amino acids. The amino acid sequence is determined by the order of codon into the specific messenger RNA. Elongation which is a cyclic process involves the certain elongation factor or EFs. Uh, elongation can be divided into three steps, uh, binding of the amino acid RNA into the A site peptide bond formation and the translocations. This we have very detailed in this we have discussed uh, when we were talking about the prokaryotic system, how the uh, incoming t, uh, uh, incoming uh, amino acid RNA is going to bind into the A site and then the, the existing peptide bond is actually going to form the existing peptide chain is actually going to form the peptide bond and then it is actually going to be translocated onto the A site and then there will be a translocation so that newly formed peptide bond containing the peptide chain will get translocated and will bind the P site. And then uh, the tRNA what is present onto the P site uh, will not have the any amino acid so it is going to be present onto the E site and from there it is actually going to uh, re get removed from the ribosomes. So, this we are not going to discuss in detail right. So, the ATS finishation complex contain the met, uh, met tRNA in the P site and the A site is free. Another amino acid tRNA is located into the A site, this requires the proper codon recognition on the messenger RNA and involvement of the elongation factor 1A and the supply of energy by the GTP. The amino acid tRNA is placed in the A site, elongation factor 1A and the GDP are recycled to bring another amino acid tRNA. Uh, then there will be a peptide bond formation, so this is what it is actually going to happen right. So, initial the first codon is actually going to be present on the P site and the subsequent codon will come on to the A site and that is how it is actually going to be start doing the synthesis. So, by sequential addition of the you know tRNA which actually contains the amino acids is actually going to be participate into this peptide synthesis. So, the enzyme peptidyl transferase catalyzes the formation of the peptide bond, the activity of this enzyme lies on to the 20S ribosomal RNA of 60S ribosomal subunits. It is therefore, the rRNA not the protein referred to as ribozyme that catalyzes the peptide bond formation. Net result of the peptide bond formation is the attachment of growing chain to the tRNA in the A site. So, the, in this uh, you know um, cartoon what you see here is that this is actually a A site and this is actually the P site ok. So, what you see here is that the uh, see uh, the, the codon is entering into the A site right it is sitting and then the peptide which is growing chain is actually being transferred onto this and then it, it moves on to the P site and from P site whatever is left over that will enter into the E site and it is actually going to exist. So, this, is, this will continue as long as you have a messenger RNA when it, it reaches to a place where you are actually going to have the stop codon then it will actually going to stop the synthesis of the peptide chains. So, then you are going to have the translocation. So, ribosome move to the next codon of the messenger RNA. This process involves the movement of the growing peptide chain from the A site to P site. Translocation requires the elongation factor 2 and the GTP. The GTP get hydrolyzed and supply energy to the move on to the messenger RNA and the elongation factor 2 and GTP complex recycled for the translocation. About 6 amino acids per second are incorporated in the course of elongation in the translation in the eukaryote. So, this is actually the synthesis rate right where you have the 6 amino acid which are going to be synthesized in per second. So, if I tell you the length of a protein, they can actually be able to calculate how long it will take for a protein to be synthesized. Remember that it does not include the uh, trans transcription actually. So, it is actually should be uh, you know first that uh, the, the RNA is going to be transcribed and then after that it is actually going to be the this speed. So, this is actually the diagram which actually shows how the, uh, uh, the elongation is going to happen in the eukaryotic system. And then we have a termination. So, uh, termination of eukaryote is almost similar with the prokaryotes which depends upon the eukaryotic release factors. So, eukaryotic release factor or the RF1 
recognizes all three termination codons that is UA, UAG and UGA and with the help of the RF3 it terminates the translations. So, upon termination the ribosome is disassembled and the complete polypeptide is released. The class 1 factor that is the RF1 is responsible for the high fidelity stop codon recognition and the peptidyl tRNA hydrolysis. The class 2 factor that is the RF3 is translational GTPA that is more closely related to the EFTU than EFG and the RF3 accelerate the peptide released and uh, increase terminal efficiency at stop codon in a manner that depends upon the GTP hydrolysis. So, this is what exactly happened and it uh, termination is exactly happened in the same way as we have discussed about the prokaryotic system. So, these are the some of the steps uh, what happen in the termination steps in the eukaryotic system. So, one of the stop codon or terminal signal that is the UA, UGA and uh, terminate the growing polypeptide chain. And when the ribosome encounter the stop codon there is a no tRNA available to bind to the A side of the ribosome instead a release factor binds to it. Once you have RF1 recognizes all three stop codon and RF3 stimulates the termination events. Once the release factor binds the ribosomal unit, rival unit fall apart releasing the large and the small subunit. The tRNA carrying the polypeptide is also released freeing upon the polypeptide product and the ribosome recycle occur at the end only in the eukaryotes. So, this is the ribosome recycling and or we will say ribosome dissociation and then, then reassociation onto the next uh, amino uh, messenger RNA. So, after the release of polypeptide and the release factor the ribosome is still bound to the messenger RNA and it is left with the 2 deacylated tRNA. The, to participate in the new round of polypeptide synthesis these messenger RNA and tRNA must be released and the ribosome must be dissociated into the small subunit and to the large subunit and that is what we have already discussed how the ribosome is getting dissociated with the help of the uh, so many uh, eukaryotic initiation factors. Collectively these events are termed as ribosomes recycling. So, what happen is that when you, you are going to start with a start codon it is going to start then you are going to enter into the elongation phase and when it enter into the stop codon after the stop codon the, the, the ribosome is getting dissociated. So, it is going to it is going to dissociate the small subunit and the large subunit and then these small and large subunit are actually going to assemble onto the new messenger RNA right and once they are get dissociated this messenger RNA is also free for starting the new cycle of protein synthesis and that is how it is good for conserving the energy in terms of not synthesizing the same messenger RNA again and again that you can be able to reuse the same messenger RNA again for the synthesis of this particular protein and on the other hand you do not have to synthesize the, the ribosome also right. You can actually uh, disassemble and then reassemble that onto the new messenger RNA on or onto this particular messenger RNA, whatever the case, right? These messenger ribosomes are free for starting the new protein synthesis cycle. So, this is all about the uh, central dogma of molecular biology where we have discussed about the translation into the eukaryotic system, we have discussed about the translation in the prokaryotic system and uh, what we have also discussed that how the eukaryotic system is different from the prokaryotic system and you might have seen that the eukaryotic system is much more complex, much require many more elongation factors, many more initiation factors and so on. So, with this brief discussion about the translation I would like to conclude our lecture here. In our subsequent lecture we are going to discuss about the post translational modifications. Thank you. Mm -hmm.